you mentioned the Mongolians, and I, I wanted to follow up on that because I think their entire culture is ha, is kind of formed around the nature of their geography there, and I think that that's quite an interesting example to explore because their sort of nomadic traditions that was because of the fact that it was largely empty plains. There weren't necessarily um, any resources to to stay by, and of course they needed lots of pack animals, and they had things like goats and things like that. So they had lots of herd animals that they could be on the move with, and this was very much shaped to the environment that they had to live on, and so it did shape the nature of their culture. I, I remember hearing about, um, is it the, the, the Golden Horde? I can't remember, but they, um, they had like a spare four or five horses, was it? Mm. Um, when they were doing horse archery so they could cycle through, but they would eat hundreds and hundreds of miles worth of grass as they were moving, and so they needed to constantly move, and, and this was all determined by the geography of the situation. So perhaps in that instance, that's a kind of niche and extreme instance, whereby you can see the fingerprints of the geography shaping the nature of their culture. Yeah, no, absolutely. The Mongolian steppe, they're like steppe peoples, mm. aren't they? Um, and so, obviously, after the introduction of of horses, and that's sort of a long, long time ago before sort of any written history, of uh, when men uh, domesticated and started riding horses, so that the steppe cultures, the Mongolian, Central Asian steppe peoples, um, of which the Mongolians are just a quite a late version of... Um, uh, they, <clears throat> it's so entrenched in their culture that they, you, you learn to ride from the earliest possible age when you could be put on a horse and um, sort of, yeah, giant open plains where there's not, uh, you, you know, you're already high up on a plateau. So there aren't, there are of course mountain ranges, but you can go for vast distances without having to cross a significant mountain range and there's no giant forests um, um, like virgin forests or anything so but there are rivers and it's very windswept yeah so it's a very specific type of geography and climate or microclimates you have up there on the Mongolian step um, and you become adapted to those specifically mm. and it makes you uh, well the way it played out in real in the real world is that it makes you superb horse warriors and very hardy and as being nomadic peoples as well, um, makes you very self-proficient. Um, and so when you come up against sort of urbanised, much weaker, softer people in Europe, um, you appear or you seem, in contrast, much, much more hardy or, or, or barbaric even. Uh, I mean, that's always the case when steppe peoples have come out of the East and invaded the Near East or Europe, Eastern Europe. They always always have seemed um, significantly more barbaric, whether it's the Scythians or the Alans or whoever it is, or even before that, like the Yamna peoples, whatever it is, um, or, or the or the Mongols. Um, yeah, they they're a product of their of their geography, mm, of I course. Think, and I think that it's certainly more important if you're nomadic or you're potentially moving around temporarily, maybe in a sort of gypsy traveller style thing, you're a bit more dependent on the environment and geography you're in than, say, uh, a town that doesn't really move. You mm. can stay in the same town your entire life and, and get by just fine, probably live a bit more comfortably, if anything. And I think that civilization makes it easier to disregard geography, and if you're living a more traditional hunter-gatherer style lifestyle, which I would say sort of step nomads seem to be, although, you know, domestication of horses didn't really go on in sort of hunter-gatherer times per se, certainly not in all areas. Um, and so I think that there are parallels there between that and they're sort of living more in a, a, a dare I say, a state of nature, although that mm -hmm. term's obviously loaded with lots of connotations that I don't want. but. It seems to me that that is certainly a factor that determines how reliant a, a, a civilization is on, on its geography. So you can be nomadic, a people can be nomadic, or you can be sort of semi-nomadic. Mm. 
the sort of many shades of grey of being nomadic, basically. Um, sort of whether you're fully sort of always on the move, just following around herds. Uh, I mean, even today in the modern world, there are sort of fairly fully nomadic peoples, aren't there? In, in for example, in Siberia, mm. um, there's there's peoples up there which follow around, around reindeer herds. And then there's people, again, still in Central Asia to this day, Mongolian people actually, yeah. um, that are sort of semi-nomadic. They move around to a degree. They, they haven't have... got fully settled. They haven't fully husbandized their animals. Mm. Um, but they're not constantly on the move, though. They have some specific sites that they go to, depending on the seasons and oh, the time yeah. of year, right? Yeah. And um, you, you use the example of following reindeer and stuff, and that's um, akin to the, the Sami in Finland, isn't it? And I think that they follow the reindeer herds, um, and, that's, and their, the reindeer herds movements are dependent on the seasons, aren't they? Um, mm. And so it makes sense that they're, they're going to be moving around somewhat semi-nomadically. It's just what their, their environmental pressures, although how much you can attribute to the environment if they're sort of semi-domesticated animals. Well, that's another thing about the um, the idea that if you are civilized in inverted commas, you don't need to worry about your geography as much. Same goes for the seasons. Mm. In our world, twenty first century West, um, you don't the, the seasons don't matter. You know, I can go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's and buy strawberries or pineapples or bananas all year round that you couldn't even grow in Britain at the best of times. So the seasons of when things grow, you, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry mm. that uh, there's certain times of year that will be more lean than others. There's certain types of food that you won't be able, you just cannot get at certain times of the year. All that we don't have to worry about at all. Um, the only thing you just might notice that it's darker uh, earlier in the evening mm -hmm. or later in the evening, or it's darker when you wake up and go to work. That's sort of the only thing you notice really, or of course the, the actual weather, how hot and cold it is, but it doesn't make any real difference. Certainly it's not a matter of survival. No. It doesn't even register mm -hmm. in your mind as something that um, contributes to your survival. Whereas think, obviously if you're nomadic or semi-nomadic, mm, absolutely it is. I think certainly some European and North American uh, countries, I'm thinking particularly sort of your Norways, your Canadas, where they live in quite cold conditions, there is some element of preparing for the seasons and, and normally they're so enculturated into living in those conditions that it, it's second nature you don't really have to think very much about what you have to do they just know um, through word of mouth really yeah um, but I've, I've spoke to Norwegians in particular um, who've explained that yeah well you know you just keep a shovel by the door and sometimes you have to dig your way out to get to work <laughs> yeah. um, it's just kind of taking it on the chin and getting on with it really but if you're prepared, you know what you're expecting, then it's not really a big deal in a, in a developed country. And it's also worth adding as well, if you're in Britain, the weather doesn't really change. It's just w what temperature the rain is <laughs> yeah. most of the time. How rainy it's going to be. Mm. And if it might be sleet or snow, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking lots of these people, again, even today, there's not that many of them, but in the ancient world, of course, it was applied to a lot more people. But that you've got the cycle of the year, your whole year is sort of you have to think about mm. uh, preparing for winter. Essentially, is what it is. Um, if you've got sort of the Tunguskan tribesmen up in sort of Siberia, or the Inuits somewhere in the very very nor or northern Norwegians, where um, yeah, for months really, or for half of the year or something, you're planning for the winter, which is going to be sort of a hellacious ordeal. And you know it is, and you've lived mm. through it many times, and so, but you know it's coming. Whereas, or even uh, the, um, the opposite of that, if you live by the equator and you know that in summer or during the days in summer, you're not really going to be able to do anything. You just have to shelter from the heat. That's all you can do. Again, as a Brit, Nothing like that comes up on your radar. It never crosses your mind. I mean, even in Spain, famously, there's the siesta. It's too hot in the middle of the day uh, to do. Any, to, I've spent to, to a lot of time out. in Spain, and 
I, I really enjoyed it when it was a ghost town and it was really hot outside. I'm a weird British person that actually likes the heat. I'm like a reptile. If it's or like a mad port- dog. <laughs> Only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday heat. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's very interesting how if you're not enculturated into those sorts of behaviours, you, you're perhaps more remiss to fall afoul of them. Like I went out into, I think it was in the Tabernas Desert in Almeria, is where actually they filmed the, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly and those Spaghetti Western trilogies. It was really good actually, they still have the full Wild West town. But that was nearly approaching 50 degrees uh, Celsius that is, um, I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. But um, it's very hot. And uh, yeah, all I did was go from one bit of shade to another bit of shade. And I had a cowboy hat on because they were selling them and it was really hot. Mm. So I didn't feel like a poser. <laughs> but it, it, it is quite serious and it makes sense that the, the culture has formed around that. Mm. But you touched on something that I wanted to look at in a bit more detail, actually, um, is you mentioned the equator. And I think that this is something very important um, just more generally is your position from the equator determines the extent of change of the seasons and so if you're close to the equator the difference between the seasons isn't really as stark as say further north you go really far north then some seasons are light some seasons are dark the entire time Mm. but um in say continental europe for example you can have highs of 40 degrees and then lows of minus 20 this is again celsius um so it can be quite severe, and you have to be prepared. And I think that that climate has shaped the sort of northern hemisphere's culture and attitudes to, to some extent, because it forces innovation, doesn't it? Because you're having to adapt to lots of different environments. And so it makes sense that countries that have seasons that are more stark tend to have more technological advancements than equatorial countries because in equatorial countries the climate stays the same and normally well in all cases because it's the equator it will be quite hot and therefore plants can fruit throughout the year Mm. and so if you're living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle you're going to have an easier time because you're not going to have to adapt your lifestyle nearly as much to the seasons as you would the further away you move from the equator Thank you for watching that clip from my series Contemplations. If you want to sign up to the website for £5 a month, you can access that series, which comes out 1pm every Saturday. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.